Hi, this is Buddy Baker. I'm uh, speaking to you uh, once again from uh, my home in uh, Chicago. Sorry I could not be with you at the, the conference that uh, you're attending, um, but uh, thought I'd at least join you in, in spirit and uh, virtually. Um, Jim asked if I could um, uh, make, you know, say a few words about uh, the, the regulatory environment um, that all of us are experiencing these days. Um, I'm uh, a banker in the United States, and so I'm going to speak to uh, what's going on in the United States uh, with regards to uh, regulatory compliance um, and uh, you know things that are going on at other banks besides my own. Uh, I work for a, a regional bank in the United States. Uh, the name is Fifth Third Bank. Uh, we're about a $140 billion bank, which uh, makes us about number 20 uh, in terms of asset size uh, among banks in the United States, among commercial banks. Uh, so there are a number that are uh, that are bigger than we are, um, but uh, there are a whole lot more that are smaller. Uh, if you're not aware, I believe there are still about uh, seven or eight thousand uh, banks in the United States, um, and the uh, the regulations that um, uh, we're all most concerned about these days are uh, the sanctions, uh, compliance with sanctions, and anti-money laundering. Uh, of course, these are regulations that uh, that carry fines if you don't pay attention to them. Uh, and uh, everybody's uh, aware, I, I assume, of the, uh, the fine that was just levied against uh, BNP Paribas. Um, I think it was actually sort of uh, established in 2014, but it's being uh, paid in 2015. Uh, and it's about $9 billion uh, for what they considered, uh, what the U.S. regulators said was a combination of uh, OFAC violations and, uh, and money laundering, that uh, uh, because uh, BNPP was actually disguising, they said, uh, where the funds were coming from or where they were going to, that uh, they were actually engaging, uh, is my understanding, that they're, they're accused of actually engaging in money laundering. Uh, so that's a pretty hefty fine. Uh, the reaction, uh, not just to that, but uh, the reaction among banks in the United States to a lot of these uh, regulations uh, with regards to um, OFAC and, uh, and anti-money laundering. Uh, and OFAC, I, I assume that's a term everybody's familiar with, but it, it, perhaps not. Uh, the Office of Foreign Assets Control in the United States is the, um, uh, the body that uh, enforces um, the, the regulations here with regards to uh, what the United States considers enemy countries, uh, designated, what we call specially designated nationals, people who are not necessarily within a country that the United States considers to be uh, behaving badly, uh, but also individuals who are outside the country or companies who are outside the country who are controlled uh, by the regime that uh, the United States um, is trying to get to amend or change its behavior or trying to change the actual um, leadership uh, in those countries. Uh, examples being North Korea, um, uh, Cuba, of course, is the one where the United States is kind of on its own. Um, Iran at this point in time. Uh, so those kinds of countries, there are only uh, maybe six of them, I think, on the U.S. list, uh, <clears throat> where there are sanctions, where the U.S. government, uh, if you put it um, uh, very uh, simply, what the U.S. government um, requires, at least of U.S. banks, is that if we see a transaction that involves either a specially designated national or one of these countries, and it's expanded now to um, uh, if we see a vessel that's on a list of uh, vessels that are owned by individuals in a sanctioned country, or even containers, are there are container numbers on these lists. Uh, if we see any of those things, then uh, what a U.S. bank is supposed to do is, is freeze the assets uh, that are flowing through on that, uh, that transaction. Um, there's been a lot of misunderstandings. Let me just speak for a second about what we really do. Um, that uh, when you freeze payment on a letter of credit where there's one of these parties, you're still paying it. It's not as if the money is getting returned or the money is somehow uh, being diverted to the U.S. government. It gets blocked and put into a, a blocked account, so it's frozen. Uh, and it's in still the name of the party that the, uh, the bank is supposed to pay. Um, so there's a, a lot of discussion in the United States uh, among bankers where they just have a misunderstanding. They say, what if I confirmed a letter of credit 
and then it turns out that um, somebody's added to the, the list of specially designated nationals, and now I have to freeze the, the payment. Doesn't that mean that I'm um, um, dishonoring my, my letter of credit? I, I, I confirmed it, now I'm not paying it. Um, I like to make sure people understand you're paying the letter of credit. You're still honoring it. You're, you're just putting the money into a blocked account, and then the party the money is going to needs to apply for license uh, to be able to get the money. Um, the question, though, that, that we're confronting with regards to OFAC is how much um, reading of all the documentation you see on a trade transaction are banks expected to do to identify whether somebody on one of these lists um, is, is involved in the transaction. Uh, and then how much money are you supposed to invest in software or other systems, uh, possibly not computer systems, but other types of procedures, to identify whether any of these parties are on a list, especially when you have uh, the list are usually maintained in, in the Latin alphabet, and you're finding names that are um, probably originally in Arabic or maybe Chinese or, or you know in other alphabets, and uh, the, the transliteration into English might not be perfect. So some of the software is looking for what they uh, call, uh, you know, it uses fuzzy logic to look for close hits. Uh, anyway, it's, it's getting to the point where banks are checking pretty much every name on every document in the United States. Uh, it used to be that uh, with a documentary collection that uh, banks said, look, the only thing I look at in a documentary collection is the draft and the cover letter, and maybe I'll take a look at the transport document to see who it's consigned to. Um, and I don't know, 10 years ago, um, maybe that was all uh, banks were doing. And over time, um, some of this is not because the regulations actually say so. It's because examiners come around. So this is the individuals who represent the regulators and are, and are uh, checking to see whether you're in compliance. Uh, they come around and they ask questions and they push uh, banks into doing more and more and more. Uh, and nobody wants to push back on an examiner. Um, so you wind up <clears throat> checking every name on every document. Uh, and then there's concern over things like uh, reimbursement authorizations or even giving a reimbursement authorization on your letter of credit. Gee, you're not going to be able to check the documents and the, and the payment will have already gone out the door. Um, uh, so that's allowing somebody to claim before you see the documents. Um, other situations like uh, uh, letters of credit that simply don't call for transport documents. People are starting to, uh, banks have said, uh, as a matter of policy, they're not going to allow uh, customers to ask for. They're not going to issue or confirm or possibly even advise letters of credit that don't call for transport documents. Um, the BPO, I think, is an interesting example of a, a direction where a lot of people are heading, and yet there are no documents in a BPO. Uh, all you see is data that describes the transaction, and all the paper documents are sent directly from the seller to the, the buyer. So we have competing uh, extremes um, with regards to what the practice uh, should be. Uh, I've seen the pendulum start to swing back a little bit where um, banks maybe have gotten a, you know, more liberal with regards to this uh, idea that letters are going to always have to call for a transport document. Uh, and instead, uh, the emphasis really is on uh, knowing your customer, knowing the kind of transaction that they're um, engaged in. And if the transaction makes sense without a transport document, you shouldn't make one up. You shouldn't refuse to handle the transaction uh, for that particular reason. Um, that kind of bridges into the knowing your customer, and that, of course, is out of the, uh, the anti-money laundering regulations. In the United States, we have the Bank Secrecy Act, which has now been um, amended or, or supercharged, if you will, by the, uh, the Patriot Act, uh, USA Patriot Act. Uh, it actually stands for something, USA Patriot Act. Um, but uh, the, the, the you know, requires that you know your customer. Uh, I think, you know, pretty much every country has um, um, some version of a requirement, uh, or at least all the developed countries, some version of a requirement to know your customer um, with the idea that you um, might identify uh, criminal activity or uh, money laundering of, of uh, you know, other kinds. Um, and, and there's a lot of concern here in the United States about what does you know, how much do I have to know my customer? And then in a trade transaction in particular, who is my customer? Um, I've got an importer and an exporter, and uh, usually there are two banks. I'm one of the two banks in the transaction. So do I have to know my customer's suppliers? Do I have to know my customer's customers? 
Uh, for that matter, if my customer wants to do business with a, uh, um, a, a you know, selling goods to a, a buyer in, uh, let's say, uh, Jamaica, uh, and, and I get a letter of credit then in from a bank in uh, Jamaica, do I have to do due diligence on that bank? Um, uh, if I'm going to receive that letter of credit, it probably had to come in by SWIFT. How much due diligence is required in order to um, uh, set up SWIFT authenticators with a, another bank? Uh, so I'm afraid I don't have any good answers. I'm just telling you these are some of the uh, issues uh, that uh, the bankers are, are dealing with right now. Um, the um, the pendulum is has swung to where it's real extreme. I'm hoping that uh, things are going to back off a, a little bit. Um, but at this point, we have the situation where banks are refusing to handle a transaction unless they've conducted due diligence on um, probably both the foreign bank who's involved and the domestic party. So that might not be a customer of theirs. So a letter of credit comes in for a beneficiary who's not a customer uh, that banks are saying, oh, I need to do some due diligence on that, uh, that beneficiary. Uh, I heard a story the other day. This is actually where it gets uh, really troublesome. Um, this ex illustrates some of what's going on. Um, banks in the United States are finding that the due diligence uh, is so expensive in order to open up a new relationship with a, a corporate client or with, a, with another bank that they're exiting entire lines of business and relationships just because it's not justified by the cost of the due diligence uh, that's, that's necessary. Um, and I've heard that some banks are, are canceling hundreds and even thousands of SWIFT authenticators because of the cost of continuing to maintain um, um, you know, customer information, conducting ongoing due diligence on banks. Banks, of course, are considered to be uh, high-risk industries because they handle money. Uh, and so you have to do enhanced due diligence on, a, on another bank in order to handle their transactions. And so um, banks are canceling um, authenticators for other banks that don't give them sufficient activity, sufficient volume of business to, to generate the revenues to, to, cost, to, to, to cover the costs uh, of the, the due diligence. And that's leaving smaller banks uh, without correspondence, that uh, the, fi the, the large banks want to exchange authenticators with them. So they're going to have to do everything through a domestic upstream correspondence. That's a, a big concern. But the story I was going to tell was that uh, one of the banks uh, I was in a, a conference call with uh, a few weeks ago uh, was reporting that a customer of theirs, not a well-known customer, but somebody that uh, did some business with their bank, had received a letter of credit covering a sale that they had made, an export sale, came through one of the, uh, the New York banks, had sent it directly to this uh, beneficiary uh, by putting it in the mail. And then the uh, beneficiary, in their cover letter, they told the beneficiary, you are not our customer, and therefore you, you are not allowed to present your documents to us, even though we're advising this letter of credit. We're not confirming it, we're just the advising bank. It's authentic, but you've got to present your documents to your own bank. And so uh, his bank uh, was looking at the letter of credit and trying to decide, like I said, they had a limited relationship, so I guess they were satisfied that they could handle this exporter, but in order to send documents to the issuing bank, they wanted to have a SWIFT authenticator in place, and this was a bank that they did not already have authenticators with. So they went to the bank and said, uh, our, you know, this company has approached us about handling this letter of credit. So this is the issuing bank, directly to the issuing bank. Uh, will you exchange SWIFT authenticators? And the other bank's response was no, um, that there's an insufficient volume to justify us setting up authenticators with you. Um, so that leaves the exporter wondering, what are they supposed to do? Um, so if we all have to go through multiple correspondence, if the exporter has to present their documents um, to their bank, who's then going to present the documents um, to another bank in the United States, who's an upstream correspondent of theirs, to then send to the issuing bank, we're adding a whole lot of layers of complexity and cost on top of the ones uh, where we already have them. So anyway, that's sort of the, just to give you the flavor uh, for what we're all uh, concerned about in the United States. And like I say, I, I believe that this is spilling out. And uh, when foreign banks like, uh, like BNPP get these huge fines, um, people do uh, pay attention and are, are trying to figure out how to deal with the U.S. regulations as well as your own uh, local version. So um, uh, here's wishing everybody good luck as we uh, figure out how to, to work through the regulations. This is Buddy Baker signing off.